in this course we have discussed about various technologies which provides more functional information more protein protein interaction and other biomolecular interactions which gives us the functional consequence of the proteins we talked to you about different type of technology platforms including protein microarrays label free biosensors and even next generation sequencing and mass spectrometry very be free idea is that finally all of this data which we generate from the wet lab experiments has to be made available to the public and likewise the whole research community should start sharing the data and as you have seen in the last uh, few lectures we are giving you the glimpse and idea that how you can start using the public databases and various resources from which you can download data and now you can use open source softwares to analyze the data set in the field of uh, cancer research and especially many clinical research a lot of data being generated which is very costly and very precious there are large funded program from different governments which aims to investigate thousands of patient sample analysis there is a new field emerging which is known as proteogenomics where aim is to look at from the same patient sample can we analyze both proteins and gene level and if you could do integrate this information then probably we are able to get more meaningful information from the same sample type in today's lecture uh, one of my research scholar uh, mr deep troop is going to show you how proteogenomics by integrating data from the genome and proteome could provide us some novel insight from the literature reviews of published data sets he will also talk about how proteogenomic approaches can help to resolve various issues of diagnosing different grades of cancer or looking at different sub type of cancer which is very difficult to understand without having a very good molecular level understanding he will also explain how proteomics and genomics data correlation can provide a much broader and meaningful picture of progression of cancer the different excellent program funded by national cancer institute in us from nih have really accelerated the whole field of proteogenomics research scientists are sharing data obtained from tissue microarrays protein microarray platforms next generation sequencer and mass spectrometry and making it publicly available the cancer genome atlas or tcga is a excellent resource for you to get started and do more investigation further from the raw data which you can obtain from this portal and likewise now cptac and other ambitious programs are available from which one could accelerate different type of proteogenomics research today deep will talk to you about the workflows of some of the case studies which were recently published using the workflow of proteogenomics in the area of cancer so let me welcome deep troop for his today's lecture after the completion of human genome project and introduction of genomics into the disease pathobiology there was a hope that genomics can lead to can bring revolutionary change in the cancer diagnosis and can lead to a path to personalized medicine but the success of personalized medicine with the help of genomics was not that much revolutionary from overall cohort of patients only few patients were respond to the predicted therapy based on the genomic profile there were some loopholes that were still present after the successful outcome of genomics so a recent paper published from zhang group that is a clinical potential of mass spectrometry based proteogenomics so in this paper he has talked how the clinical potential of the uh, mass spectrometry based proteogenomics can be introduced the personalized medicine with the help of genomics was not that much successful due to a number of reasons if we can see that with the help of genomics solving the problem like cancer is like jumping from one hurdle to the last hurdle and we are not taking into account a number of conditions and parameters that is coming in between the two hurdles so we are getting a complete profile of the genomics different types of mutations 
different aberrations, but in the same hand we are missing different epigenetic aberrations, transcription regulations, alternative splicings and protein uh, proteomics profiling. So all this important information need to be taken into account to understand the pathobiology of the cancer and then only this, can, uh, this tool can be used for the diagnosis and treatment. So the message from this slide is that all this information starting from DNA to mRNA to protein need to be considered to reach to the goal and to diagnose to bring a revolutionary change in the cancer and uh, cancer diagnosis and treatment. So before I move how proteogenomics is, is playing a role in cancer diagnosis, I want to give a brief account of what is cancer driver genes. So cancer driver gene is defined as one whose mutation increase net cell growth. The total number of driver gene is unknown, but we assume that is considerably less than 19,000 which has been uh, given by Tokeima et al. in 2016. So from driver DV, uh, DV repository, you can see like the top driver genes includes TP53, EGFR, P10 and how this hallmark driver genes are important in the glioblastoma, in the glioblastoma tumor genesis, we all know. So here is the mutation profiles of those driver genes where the top driver genes are P10, TP53, EGFR and we can see the mutational profile in terms of samples which is in the x axis. So if I, if we choose one of the top 3 cancer driver genes that may be EGFR and we can understand that what is the expression of this EGFR gene in glioblastoma. So we found that the expression of the EGFR gene in glioblastoma is pretty high. So one of the top 3 cancer driver gene in glioblastoma is EGFR and if we want to check the expression of EGFR in terms of in taking into account the other uh, cancer we found in case of GVM EGFR is highly overexpressed in both primary solid tumor and recurrent solid tumor. So till now the genomics has given a lot of information about glioblastoma. But if we take into account the co correlation between the exon and protein, we will found that the driver score related to protein and exon is also giving some new information. This panel is to display the driver score distribution of exon and protein position which help research, researchers quickly find the region of the gene with abundant deleterious mutations. So now we understand that we did not consider a lot of things between the genomics and the precision medicine that not all mutated genes are stably expressed as proteins and genes that are expressed can be post translationally modified. Therefore precision medicine that relies solely on genomic based assay will exclude a lot of potentially relevant information like miRNA, microRNA. So to support the previous statements and to give you a complete glimpse how the powerful tool of proteogenomics can be can be very helpful to solve different kinds of cancer. So in this study they have taken 169 ovarian tumor samples from TCGA metadata and they have they tried to analyze rather correlate the genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics and phosphoproteomics. So before going into the paper. Let me give a glimpse of this kind of mutation and how this mutation can lead to lethality of a cell. The, so the diagram has been taken from Walsh et al 2015 where we can see the functioning of PARP enzyme and how PARP enzyme is helping in DNA repair of single strand DNA break. If PARP enzyme is inhibited, so there is no repair takes place and which helps which rather lead to collapse replication fork and the BRCA deficiency do not allow homologous recombination to happen. In, in C, the deficiency in the HR homologous re recombination and base excision repair together lead to synthetic lethality than the correlation. So the sample information 
tumors were selected by examining the associated TCGA metadata to select tumors. On the basis of putative homo homologous recombination deficiency, presence of germline or somatic BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, BRCA1 promoter methylation or homozygous deletion of p tens were taken. So, this clustering will is giving us the complete landscape of what are the different pathways are involved and how protein and mRNA are playing role and what is the correlation between the protein and mRNA in this pathway. So, till now we understand that the protein and mRNA correlation is there and how this protein and mRNA co correlation is also playing a role in terms of biological pathway. But now they also tried to understand that how CNA that is copy number aberration in each tumor is playing a role with protein and mRNA correlation. The blue one are the complete profile of the data generated whereas the black one is the data that is present that is all that is already present in the database. So, from this CNA mRNA correlation and CNA protein correlation they found that two important two important protein that is CHD4 and CHD5 are having the maximum number of CNA, CNAs. So, when they further studied they found that these two proteins are involved in chromatin organization. So, to understand the complete biological pathway they take they took phosphopeptides, proteins, transcripts and CNA and they found that these are the top pathways that is playing a role in this cancer pathobiology. So, out of which PDGFR beta which we all know is a angiogenic uh, uh, receptor is also showing an important correlation in terms of biological pathway. To understand the complete landscape of the cancer pathobiology, they incorporated mRNA, protein and phosphopeptide data into one picture and where we can we, we see that the PGFR beta is upregulated in both mRNA and protein. So, this upregulation of the PGFR beta is not only giving a clue to a active angiogenesis, but also showing that how, what are the different downstream regulatory factors that are also upregulating or downregulating in terms of mRNA and protein. So, further they tried to do a DDN analysis. So, DDN analysis is differentially dependency network analysis where the proteins curated from the literature and from the C bio portal. So, C bio portal helps, helps you to get the data out from the TCGA and they identified a sub network of 30 protein that displayed co-expression pattern differentiating from HRD uh, from non-HRD patient. And from this DDN analysis they found that histone acetylation or deacetylation proteins are coming are playing are coming into the clusters and which includes HDAC1, RBP4, RBP7, EP300 and HUS1. So, from the last part of the study they understand that histone acetylation and deacetylation are playing an important role. So, this clue was enough to give an idea that acetylated peptides need to be studied. So, from the global proteome data they prepare a acetylated peptide database search strategy and identify and quantify the acetylated peptides. From there they identified around 399 acetylated peptides and 50 acetylated significant peptide between HRD and non-HRD. So, as so from this 15 acetylated significant peptide they found that K12 and K16 that is acetylation of lysine in 12 and 16 were found. So, they validated the K12 and K16 using synthetic peptide and targeted analysis using SWAT MS. In the same thing they found that the K12 in terms of eye track data were upregulated in HRD negative and same thing has been validated in SWAT and they found the same upregulation in HRD negative. So, they went back and further search in the literature and they found that the acetylation of the H4 has previously reported to be involved in the choice of D DNA double, break, double strand break DSB repair pathway. The relationship 
is regulated partially by HDAC1, a protein also identified in DDN analysis. The potential role of HDAC in modulating the choice of DSB repair pathway has been identified. So the conclusion from the study, we understand that the activation of PDGA for pathway in patient could potentially stratify selective enrollment in trial of anti-angiogenic therapy, a recombinant human monoclonal antibody that blocks the angiogenesis by inhibiting VGFA has already been trialed in patients. So the PDGA for pathway, the involvement of PDGA for pathway in this cancer is also giving this recombinant humanized monoclonal antibody role in limelight. Apart from this, HRD acetylation K12 and K16 on histone H4 may provide an alternative biomarker of HRD. A rationale for this selection of patient in future clinical trials of HDAC inhibitors alone or in combination with PRP inhibition can be also tried. So the moral from the study we understand the ability of proteomics to complement genomics is providing additional insights into the pathway and processes that drives ovarian cancer biology. Not only the complete data which we are getting from the genomics is not enough to lead to a well profiled diagnosis and treatment of cancer. So all the important things like mRNA information, protein information and PTMs, the post translational modification information need to be gathered and further correlated among themselves and then only we can reach to a conclusion and we can take this information and further validate it in clinical trials. So now we understand that how cancer driver mutation, mRNA, protein need to be taken into account to reach to the molecular target or cancer drug. From the last study, we understand that how the group has only generated the proteomics data and they have tried to co correlate the pro their proteomics data with the already available mRNA, CNA data from the databases. So Firehouse can be used to download this kind of data like if we select a disease name that may be glioblastoma multiform and we can see like all the data which are available in the TCGA can be downloaded from here. So TCGA data version from 2016 from glioblastoma, clinical SNPs, methylation and mRNA sequencing data and reverse phase protein array data are already available. So we can use this firehouse to download the data. So now we are able to understand how proteogenomics and correlation of mRNA and protein can give us better insights of a particular disease. But to deal with this amount of big data, prepare a panel which can help in the treatment or diagnosis of cancer. We need to think about different predictive and machine learning based analysis. I have taken an example of a paper, a neural network approach to multi biomarker panel discovery by high throughput plasma proteomics profiling of breast cancer. Whereas study A and study B, 40 cancer types and 40 controls were taken, whereas in study C, 20 cancer types and 20 controls were taken. Further, they have done the proteomic analysis and they found the 246 proteins are common between 3 studies. After this analysis, they have taken the data and tried to prepare an artificial neural networking model taking study A as a training set, study B as a testing set and study C for validation. So in this kind of artificial neural networking, in most of the cases for the training set maximum that means around 70% or more data need to be taken. whereas for study B, 30% data need to be taken. The model further validated with blind data set to check the efficiency of the model. In most of the cases, the ac accuracy of the model need to be more than 80 or 85%. So this artificial neural networking gives a panel, base 3 panels with 5 markers and with the accuracy more than 85%. So further these panels were taken forward and checked in large cohort of samples to validate the data. So like this, we can use artificial neural networking and different machine learning strategies 
to understand and predict top candidates that are playing key role in tumorigenesis and further development of the cancer. So the main concept is the different protein understand the complete pathobiology and then only the landscape of a disease can be drawn. And from there we can understand and we can and that can lead to a drug target or precision medicine. So by now you know that there is a huge amount of data that is available in the public repositories and databases which could be utilized and extracted for the further data analysis. There are big research programs like Human Protein Atlas, the Cancer Genome Atlas or TCGA as well as different laboratories working worldwide including Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT have shared the data into various databases. All of these researchers and scientists are making their data publicly available. More recently, now the Cancer Moonshot project, an international cancer proteogenome consortium also aims to investigate the proteogenomic data from the same patients and intention is to make it publicly available and share with the entire scientific community. All you have to do is track the data, perform different type of analysis and then make meaningful insight. You can always define a unique question from the same sample and look at what is the best answer from the large number of sample data sets available to you. You can also compare the data from different laboratories or even integrate data obtained from different population, look at the effect of the same disease in different uh, geographical locations, different uh, races, uh, different age groups as well as the effect of different treatment or certain diseases which may have uh, you know the recurrence nature, many of these things could be investigated from these kind of publicly available data set. I hope these uh, manuscripts which we have discussed today have given you uh, a very impressive glimpse of how genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics and sometimes even metabolomics together could provide you the much in depth information uh, at the cellular level which was otherwise not possible few years ago. I hope you will be able to use some of these technologies and some of these data sets in your own research. In the next lecture, I will talk to you more about the various revolutions which are happening in the field of omics in general, of course more in the interactomics and proteomics and try to give you much more sense about what is exactly happening in this whole field which is really remarkable and revolutionary in nature. Thank you.